Dr. Nick Almond. Hey. Really, 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 really glad because really glad to get your time. This is a whole new area I want to delve into a bit deeper. I like to think I know everything about everything. I like to think I know more more about this than most people, as in crypto and that whole what the whole like umbrella of things that come un, un, underneath it. I don't. I know I don't. You and you are much knowledge, more knowledgeable than me. So thank you for your time. Yeah, pleasure, mate. Thank you for having me on. Um, and. And also on that, on that uh, Educational Journey YouTube podcast as well, which we, we'll definitely mention that later on as well. Cool. Right. However, off topic, straight off topic, straight on the tangent. Yeah. We were talking the icebreaker. You were talking about your background in data science, physics, and we were talking about COVID. And you had eyes on, you said you were tracking the COVID data early on in the pandemic when the numbers were really low, right? Yeah. And it was a cause for concern. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, I'll tell you about, so at the time I was a, uh, an associate dean at the London College of Fashion, um, which is a bit of a weird route from physics, but we got there somehow. And then, so it was my responsibility really to, you know, plan the curriculum and make, you know, basically help the, the staff there to prepare for as, as much as possible for, you know, be good at teaching and all that sort of stuff. But um, I have a bit of a background, you know, in physics and data science, so I can write a bit of Python code to understand data. And I remember the day the pandemic, like I remember the morning um, on the news when they said a novel coronavirus has, you know, has been, is out in the wild in, in China. And I got a real deep sinking feeling because I know what that means, novel coronavirus. Well, what and, does it mean? Well, it just means that when, when there's a new virus and there's no, there's no, there's no like immunity there's no basic immunity for this thing. They're extremely dangerous because um, they can tr transmit really quickly and they can be genuinely deadly. And the, what makes, what the degree of deadliness, if you like, is, is um, all about a single digit of data, the case fatality ratio. Um, and that is as accurate as you can get it, how many people who get it die. And um, essentially, it's dead simple. You count the, you've got the data of the number of cases and the number of deaths. You divide one by the other. Um, so, yeah, I, there was a John Hopkins University out in the States were publishing this data on like day 10, 15. Um, as it transpired, it had been chugging along quite a long time before that in China, before we got the data. But um, That's quick, quick, yeah. at that point, were they counting the mitigating, mitigating circumstances, mitigating factors in someone's death? Which became a very no, high profile. This on. was way before any okay. narrative around comorbidities. Okay. And, comorbidities, you know, that's the phrase. Yeah, yeah, so really this, like, what it transpires is there's the, this case fatality ratio, or your probability of, of dying if you get the virus, varies radically depending on your age and health bracket, all that sort <clears> of stuff, <throat> which is always the case. In, in sort of epidemiology and, and understanding viruses and stuff. Um, but at this point, we just had raw data coming out of China. And the data was saying that around one in 20 people would die. And um, there was an interest. So I was watching this and I, you can sort of see, watch the data and it creates like an S curve. Uh, with an, and an S curve, it uses something called the logistics function. It's basically like there's a carrying capacity where it's like there's the total amount of people who can get it. Um, or And it, it maps to a lot of different systems. But you, we trace this perfect S curve. So I managed to build this S curve. And that's looking like it might be a logistic function. And we, we traced it perfectly into this. Um, and we sort of hit this level. And at this time, the cases were going up. Deaths weren't really... And the CFR was going down to about 2%, 1%. And then they added a bunch more deaths. So if you look at the China data back in the very early, you've got the um, case fatality ratio starts trending down and then jumps back up to about 5%, 5 something like that. And around that time, the first cases started happening in Italy and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I just like, right, this is this is out now. There's, it's broken containment. It's very, very likely to be a pandemic. Um, and yeah, I, I watched all this data at this point, all the data started to open up all around the world, you know, <clears throat> started doing all this analysis on it. Um, and yeah, I was like, it was genuinely scary at the time. 
because one in twenty, one in twenty chance of death with no nuance on age or anything like that is is genuinely terrifying thing. Um, so yeah, it was just like a yeah really weird time. Spent a lot of time going into that. There's, there's a YouTube video of me somewhere talking about this very early on, just right when we first did the lockdowns. Um, but yeah, it just felt like that all that data was, I just had stopped doing it in the end because it was all meaningless. It was just like the why? data was just, what was, what was, what was going wrong with it and why? Well, I mean, for one, the number of cases, so to get an accurate, like that was the most important number in the world. Case fatality ratio still is and always was, and we still don't know what it is. There's no, we never like really pinned down what the act. So you get this thing called the infection fatality ratio which is like slightly different what about the r number the r number is the rate of um like propagation of the virus so the rate at which it's the doubling number they call it so that's the so when you're modeling an exponential curve it's the rate at which it does this so the lower r goes up yeah. goes like this it's a slow up quick high r goes like that it's a, yeah high um, r, sorry for people listening high, high r number it's a rapid increase in yeah whatever you're counting in a Low R number, it's a steadier incline. Right? Yeah, it's kind of the, the rate of propagation. It's like the if you think, um, if you get the virus, how many people do you give it to? If you give it to two people, the R number is two. Pro like average it out. If you give it to three people, the R number is three. If you give it to like, there's a probability that you'll give it to um, two people over two infections, it's one. It's so it just, it just allows you to model it. We can come back on to this, circle around to this if you want, because I know I interrupted you, but why were, why were they focusing to the UK on the R number in the new, in the using the government briefings as opposed to CFR? Um, because it's just like the rate of spread. So basically what, what a lot of people don't really get the head is, is exponential, um, exponential increases. Like a, it's, it's surprisingly strange. It's like, um, <coughs> So you can look like, the classic example is if you put some like bacteria in, like if you put one bacteria in a jar, um, and it doubles every minute, um, and basically you can say the jar is full at mid, like midday. Let's say it starts at eleven, should, like at midday the jar is full of bacteria. One minute to twelve, it's half full, and so the rate at which, and that's like an R number of two. Oh, okay. So yeah. like exponential increase in, in like exponential um uh data like that it increases really rapidly and it gets out of hand very 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 quickly and so they were they were going up like the r number is when it starts to go through the and roof. so they were using that as a figure to try and show demonstrate how effective or how effective or not the lockdowns have been and how much we should yeah so the, locking the concept was we need to restrict the transmission graph of like as much as possible because when you get this like exponential thing, it, it just does genuinely go like everyone in the country's got it. And if that happens, then all the hospitals are overwhelmed and it's, and yeah, and we, we could, it could have happened. And I think there's, you know, I was like, you know, ultimately the lockdown scared me more than the virus did. Um, mainly because um, the idea that a government can put any everyone in the country under house arrest essentially at the drop of a hat um and i think a lot about governance that's like my thing that that power is a terrifying power that's extremely dangerous um and i don't think we give enough credence to it at the time or still how much how much power that was i think we forget i certainly had until we were talking the icebreaker about what we felt about lockdowns before the lockdown started. I remember having a conversation with someone and they were talking about the, a lockdown coming. And I said, two weeks, max two weeks. I said, mm -hmm. if you shut the country down for any longer than two weeks, that is nightmare scenario. Yeah. Two years it went for. I know. Two years, you know. Well, and this is why the economy is collapsing now. So it's like the, you can't shut the economy down for that long and not deal with the, the, the outcome of that. It's, it's perturbed. It's so like the global markets are a complex system. So you can't really predict what's going to happen in the markets are complex. <clears throat> you can predict them, then everyone would make money who traded. Um, so they're, they're this weird complex system. And, the, and a fundamental thing about complex systems is you can't predict them. They're fundamentally unpredictable. You can't see what's going to happen. 
but they exhibit this behavior where they can radically change in state and um, like one, you can push, it's like the domino effect type thing. You can, tiny little perturbation create can create big changes down the line. So the bigger the changes that you put in, the more likely you are you're going to get these big cascading effects down the line. So for me now, the banks, you know, some banks collapsing, you know, global, like, 14% inflation, all that sort of stuff. It's all it's all due to the lockdowns. It's all it's all due to that period of time where we essentially upended the entire practice of the world economy. Um, and it's just we're just seeing the kind of cascading effects ripple through the economy from now, and it's, we're going to be seeing it for decades. We weren't in a good position before that, though, financially, if I remember. No, the, the, everything's fairly fragile. I mean, we the post two thousand eight financial crash. It's not like we fixed the problems, right? We, it's like we fixed the issue. We, I mean, we didn't even fix the issue with um, credit default swaps. And, you know, there, there was this particular, you know, bundling mortgages into these things and flogging them on and, and all this sort of stuff. That was a deeply, like, broken practice that made the economic <coughs> system fragile and was obviously silly when you're giving people who can't afford a mortgage a million dollar house and all this sort of stuff it was it was obviously going to collapse but you know none of the banks got punished for it you know none of the people who actually did this incredibly greedy reckless behavior actually paid the price for it um so yeah you didn't fix any of the problems we papered over it with a bunch of money printing and and you know economic policy the masked the problem it didn't fix the problem um and yeah, I think the, the the financial systems were fragile to begin with, um, and yeah, now it's looking really, really shaky. Okay, just going back to the to COVID. So, a question on the CFR: Did you track the CFR throughout the pandemic? Yeah, so I, I basically wrote these scripts that I could just hit go, and then it'd just take all the data from the APIs and just keep. And, and I eventually just stopped bothering <laughs> because the data was so obviously wrong. Like. There was a point where you know we were in the second lockdown and and the, the, the uk data still said the cfr was 15 percent. and you know you can look at the websites they it wasn't like it was interpreted that, that was the public data and that's what would that be one in that's like a one, one in five in, one chance five, of death yeah. right yeah so it's the it was totally nonsense it was just absolute nonsense the data that was like put out to the public um was lies like it just oh, 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 and, and and it wasn't necessarily lies it was the tests that we got were so bad that they were like inaccurate and As in testing to see if someone's positive like yeah yeah so the covid tests were inaccurate and there wasn't enough of them so the data was just really bad you know the the um so the data fidelity was poor, but it was just all it was just all nonsense. It was it, at that point it was pointless even looking at it anymore. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Well, it surprises me how tolerant we were of the lockdown. I mean, you made the point there. Yeah, but I think maybe one of the reasons one of the reasons we you can say tolerant is one word, or you can say we cope with it really well, depending on which your perspective of it is. Yeah. Right? You know, we got through that disaster really well. Oh, we we got with that bullshit. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons I think is, well, imagine if they hadn't been furlough. Mm -hmm. so the thing with the thing with the way we locked down is, most people were still had money to buy things in their food. Yeah. If we hadn't have done that, I think we would have been in a very different situation. It may, may it might be Mad Max down right now. Yeah, yeah, that totally. That, that's, that's the only way out of it. It's the only way that you can make people stay at home, but ultimately, still need people who do the bit you know, like there was still the essential workers right there was still the delivery drivers and still the police force and there was still the um the healthcare practitioners so there's always a base level of people who are moving around in society that are spreading the virus so there's no way there's like there's um there's a point where it becomes impossible to stop so the outcome is the same everyone in the world gets it twice um which is roughly where we're at now right it's like um and yeah, so and there's, there's, the lockdowns did not stop the pandemic. We know that. What they did do was stop the hospitals getting overwhelmed. Um, now, I think we probably could have done about ninety percent less lockdowns. We could have done much more targeted things when when it became clear that the hospitals were in danger. Um, but yeah, it was 
um, the reason why people complied to it is because they were scared. They were scared, and and you know the messaging around um, you you you're basically going to kill someone else if you go out and spread the virus around. And it's and yeah, it's like a but ultimately there was always going to be people who didn't comply to it that keeps the virus going. And some of that's just from work and some of that's because um, people just weren't bothered about it. Um, but yeah, there was a period, I remember going for um, a walk in Hyde Park and there being like a sitting down on the grass with my wife and daughter and then a police horse coming over and saying, move. And, you know, and then there was a point where we've got the stay at home on, you know, Boris every night giving us the, and it was just super dystopian. Like I, I was just genuinely super worried about it. And I still think there's an overhang. I think once you go to population control like that, the power and influence that governments had and have now has has increased, right? It's like the, the whole framing around centralized power has shifted. I think, you, you know, if there was an authoritarianism dial we've gone up four or five points since before the, and I think that's starting to manifest in other policies. And I think there's, you know, governments have generally become more paternalistic and, and more, you know, protective over their citizens and more willing to reduce people's freedoms for our, for the greater good and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and largely this is a Chinese social policy, right? No one had ever, ever considered broad spectrum societal level lockdowns until China did it. You know, that, that, that's shocked everyone. People, it's like kind of a priced in now that like lockdowns are kind of normal now. But that was the first time anyone had done it on such a, you know, millions of people in lockdown. Like it was, that was super weird at the time. And actually it's Chinese social policy that we adopted kind of fairly uncritically. Um, so yeah, I'm super worried about it. I think they should like, if we ever do it again, I, I don't think it'll work as well next time. Was it? Was it so, that Chinese social policy we adopted, or was it was it just a magnification of known infection control methods, as in lockdown, instead of on a regional scale, you do it on a national scale? Yeah, the the only time it had kind of been done in practice at that not any kind of scale really was like in Ebola outbreaks. In like, so there was research out there that had tracked Ebola moving between sort of villages in the Congo and places like that. And they found that essentially like drawing a big cordon around that and just saying no one no one moved between villages was the way that the that it stopped. Um and there was people like um Nassim Taleb, who's very um I don't know if people are aware of this dude. He's he wrote a book called Anti Fragile and Um Black Swan and, and a few of these other things. Um, skin in the game and, the, and he wrote this paper which was like um, you know everything needs to be shut down now like there's this people shouldn't deal with this fatalistic idea that it's you know you can you can't stop this thing we need hard lockdowns now and the idea propagated from China to Western social policy very very quickly but to my knowledge there's never been a, um, a broad spectrum lockdown like that until that moment uh, and we just did it you know, um, uncritically, and I'm still not convinced it was the right approach. Was it that? Was it that whole situation or that that, this, that period um, when you're realising these things? Was it that that piqued your interest in governance and authoritarianism? I mean, I was a governance researcher at the time. Um, I so I, my sort of trajectory was sort of physics. I did astrophysics for a little bit, <clears throat> and then moved into teaching mathematics. And a lot of my students were maths and education students. So they were like training to be maths teachers. And then I sort of really, I'd been very passionate about education up to that point and was a pretty good lecturer and, you know, got good feedback from the students. And um, so then really got into learning theory and then ultimately started running courses and then training staff at a kind of institutional level. And there's no escaping the fact that that comes down to governance. Like, how do you um, how do you get the outcomes at a scale through policy and practice and that kind of stuff? So, spent six or seven years going into this sort of governance theory um, research, how we learn as a collective stuff. Um, but it was when the pandemic happened that I I'd been interested in crypto since around 
2016 very seriously. But it was when the it was when the lockdowns happened that I left the university and went into it full time. I thought well, now is the time to get into this. Why? Why? Um, a few reasons. I think there's the global shift. So one of the things I was doing at that time is training all the staff to instead of teaching in a classroom with students to teach on Microsoft Teams. And there was just like all of a sudden these like people, some people, because, you know, I was at London College of Fashion, these people like make shoes for a living and things like that. Some of them didn't even use email. They're like old school, you know, leather workers and stuff like that. And all of a sudden they've now got to teach how to make shoes on like via Zoom essentially, you know, and, and they were like making them out of cardboard with the student, incredibly challenging. But the, the shift towards remote work I always thought it was going to happen. I always thought there was going to be a, a shift towards more decentralized work. I always thought um, people going to sit in a cubicle nine to five every day was on borrowed time. I don't think that's ever going to, I don't think that, I think that we'll look back on that as a weird thing that we did in 20, 30 years time. So I always thought it was going to change, but I'd have thought it's going to change now and it has changed now. So when it comes to decentralized working and this, like my interest in DAOs and all that sort of stuff, they facilitate people coordinating at a distance and collaborating at scale. And so the the whole move to decentralized work, remote work was one of the things where I thought, okay, I thought this was going to happen in like 2030, but it's, this has fast tracked it. And I think that's definitely been the case. Um, and also the space itself had, you know, after the last bear market had started to like, they start to get exciting again. There was like DeFi had just come out and it just felt like the right time. It was just like, this is the, um, this is the move for it. But generally, yeah, my, my interest in decentralization had always been there, but, um, just felt really, um, important at that point. So I think like my desire to go into space and work in it full time just increased like quite dramatically at that point because I felt it was necessary. So when did. When did the blockchain tech and utilization of crypto mm -hmm. of commerce come on your radar then in terms of governance and Oh early and this is why I mentioned in the icebreaker that I wish I'd cared more about investing because I I I discovered Bitcoin in twenty ten. <clears throat> so um the first block was in two thousand nine in January. And no one knew about it for at least a year, just the cypherpunks, just like a very, very small group of open source coders messing around with it. There was like, Satoshi was like basically the only user outside of like a dozen other people for the first year. Um, and then I was teaching cryptography at the time, um, number theory and cryptography. And so I was just searching for use cases of cryptography and emerging, you know, new things to get the students excited. And I found the Bitcoin white paper and you couldn't, there was no exchanges at that point. You could, you could only install the software and mine it yourself. Um, and yeah, I'd be a billionaire now if I'd done that. <laughs> but, oh, no. what, what stopped yeah. you? Um, I think for one, I think it was just like, all oh, right, this is just a weird emerging open source project. Um, and even being the kind of person who would like, you know, go and compile these things and, and install it. I remember telling my students, like, like <clears throat> this is going to change the world. Um, but yeah, it just, it just felt a bit too weird and esoteric. Um, it came back on my radar in like 2012, 2013, and a few of my mates were sort of trading it when the exchanges opened up and stuff. Um, I bought some to get some sketchy nootropics off the internet. There was a <laughs> website called Meds for Bitcoin where you could get like uh, Medafinil. <laughs> Off, yeah. uh, and it was like Medefil is just like a it's it's the low it's it, it, my it's like an ADHD meds right it was like I had a load of papers to write, um, but that was the first time I I bought I think it was about two or three bitcoins, um, and they were like twenty thirty bucks each something like that. Um, spent one of them and lost the keys to the other two, which was again very upsetting. Um, but yeah, it was a kind of progressive thing. It wasn't until 2016 when at the time I would, I'd built a decentralized organization inside an institution I was working at at Liverpool Hope University. Um, and it was, 
it was designed to allow people to like self-organize into groups and learn together and get funding for ideas and let these ideas bubble up from the surface and all this sort of stuff. And then at that point, uh, the DAO happened, like the Ethereum um, project. And then, then I sort of got onto Ethereum, got my head around smart contracts and then just became completely obsessed. And at that point, um, I would say I've spent like, you know, 40, 50 hours a week researching crypto since 2016. Um, and then, you know, now it's like all my time. <laughs> it's like a mm. hundred hours a week now. Uh, but yeah, it's a borderline obsession now, I would say. Yeah. Look, before we delve into some of the rabbit holes you mentioned there, yeah. people, and people, people, some people listening thinking, what, the, what, who, what? Yeah. Um, right. Crypto, the term crypto. Yeah. Okay. That holds uh, a stigma to many, 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 many people. They, and when they think of crypto, they think, uh, oh, money making scam, uh, fraud, bad people, and uh, criminals use it to buy dodgy trophies. Yes. <laughs> and criminals use it and uh, they can hide. Right. What does crypto mean to you? The term. Yeah. I mean, so like I said, I used to teach crypto. Crypto used <clears throat> to be the word associated with cryptography. So. Cryptography is the basically the science of hiding secrets. Um, so it's been around since you know, like the first known cipher. I think there was some around in China and stuff, but the Caesar cipher was like Julius Caesar used to use it to communicate, um, you know, battle plans. Cipher? What's a cipher? So a cipher is like something you, you turn text into cipher text. So like an encrypted text like a with a cipher. Of, a string of characters then looking at it means is meaningless but if you've got the key yes you can decode it exactly so the, the caesar cipher is the classic which is you take the alphabet and you have a um let's say a key of five and that moves the alphabet <coughs> forward five letters so you can write a message and then if you know the key is five you can decode it and like that worked in you know two thousand years ago but obviously it's pretty easy to crack um so Everything since then is about making these ciphers more um, difficult to crack. Um, and then, you know, there's one of the big ones is public key cryptography, which is it uses something um, or it basically scrambles the, the the text into a cipher text into a hash. And it's public, so you can put this thing publicly and you, it, it works one way. You can't work backwards the other way without huge amounts of computation power, which is basically how Bitcoin works. Um, and it's just very simple mathematics. It's very, it's very, um, it's, a, it's, it's like a quirk of the universe that you can do this, that you can basically run something through a hash function. It scrambles it and it's almost impossible to decode unless you've got the private key. And this is the basis of what the underlying foundation of block te blockchain technology, right? Yes. So, Blockchain, so crypto as we know it now, and you know, the cryptographers are very annoyed that okay. crypto has <laughs> taken this word. Uh, but crypto as it know it, as we, and I see it as an evolution of that field, right, of the field of cryptography, um, <clears throat> to create systems where instead of just hiding secrets, you can transmit uh, value. So Bitcoin was the first of these things. That you could, I, I consider the Bitcoin Genesis block to be like the big bang moment for crypto. That was the, it didn't exist before then. And then it was like the big bang moment was there, released into the world. And basically all it is, is they all work on this notion of a blockchain. And it uses cryptography to basically link these blocks. So a block is just a file. So the way I sort of try and get people to imagine it is um, classic ledger. So if you can picture, you know, like Ebenezer Scrooge with his big ledger writing down what who owes what. So Billy owes me. Records. Yeah, it's just a ledger. It's like Billy owes me $100. <clears throat> and then Billy's give me $50 back. So I'm going to update the ledger. It's just one of them. Essentially, a, a block is like a page in the ledger. And a new page gets added every 10 minutes. Um, and there's no way to turn the pages back. You can look, read the whole book, but you can't ever edit the previous pages. You can't tip X stuff out, you can't change it. Once it goes on yes. the page, it is there forever. 
it's extremely difficult yes, to change, it, almost impossible. It's theoretically possible, but what you need to do is get all of the compute power. So that at the moment, so essentially what Bitcoin does, it, it uses this, it actually kind of does this reverse of the hashing function. So it's like cracking a, um, it's like cracking one of these passwords. Um, and in order to crack one of these passwords, you need like um, so many computers just all like trying. It's like a lottery. You can think of it like a, playing a lottery. And you put your number, you guess a number, put it into a function and out comes another number. It's like in one end, out the other. And if the number that you get out the other end is close to zero, you win. If you've got the number closest to zero in a particular time, you win a block, which at the moment is about six and a half Bitcoins, about $100,000, $112,000, something like that. So you're rewarded for playing this lottery. And you run these computers that keep trying these numbers, and it's trillions of uh, times a second. Um, so you can think of this as like a global lottery game where everyone's playing it to win these Bitcoins. Um, which are now, you know, pretty valuable. Uh, and what they're doing is securing the network. So it's like all of these sort of greedy miners are just trying to win these Bitcoins. They don't really care about Bitcoin. They just they just want the Bitcoins. But what they're doing, the outcome is that they're, they're making it very difficult to go and edit those previous pages. And they're validating transactions to be true. Yeah, so there's anyone can run a node in the network. So anyone can do So a node is just the software, the Bitcoin software. This is what I should have installed back in 2010. <laughs> um, and at the time you could mine it on a laptop, right? Now you need these like warehouses full of um, purpose-built machines to do it. Um, but in order to start winding back the pages, you need at least 51% of the- To edit, pre to edit to previous edit, records, you mean? Edit the yeah, previous, yeah, records. previous records. So really the whole notion of crypto is built on this idea of securing an un uneditable ledger. So how many so how many miners are there at the moment on Bitcoin? Do they estimate in the world? Um, how many nodes? Nodes. There's about fifteen thousand nodes, and these are just you know hobbyists of people who run. So the nodes basically, when you send a Bitcoin transaction, you you broadcast it to the network, and all the nodes are waiting for new transactions, and it flows through these um, nodes and they check if it's valid. There's quite, the Bitcoin is very restrictive. You can only basically change like who owes what um, every 10 minutes. And yeah, essentially, so the, you send a transaction and those nodes check there's no funny business in that transaction. It has to comply to the network rules. And if it does comply to the network rules, it says, okay, great, and publishes it to what's called the mempool which is like a pool of transactions. What's the minimum percentage for that, for it to be confirmed by nodes before it can be published? Because you couldn't publish it if one node confirms it, right? Yeah, it's um, it's a good question about the minimum percentage. I think it basically just needs to propagate through, through the network. So basically the node publishes it. They all see the transaction, so they're basically all seeing it okay. roughly simultaneously. And um, essentially it's 51% again if 51% of the nodes think this is a good transaction and 49% don't, then the 51% win. So in order to go back to this, in order to change a previous record, so as an example, like uh, I I exchanged some Bitcoin about a year and a half ago for, it was Vera in exchange though, and it was for a pint, Vera, yes. Vera card, you know, yeah. ultimately it included fiat and like the whole chain, but yeah. let's say that, well it did, that, that, that exchange of Bitcoin gets re has been recorded. Yep. It is on the it is on the ledger. It is on the blockchain. Yep. In order for someone to go and want to change that record to say some other value. Yep. For what or some other what some other in wallet address. So it didn't actually go from me to vendor. Went from someone else to vendor. Or me yep. to someone else. They would need to get access to and take control of at least fifty one percent of. Those fifteen thousand nodes you mentioned, and everything else that yeah. is acting and validate on the network. So you, it would cost you, um, you know, millions of dollars to to let's say you could just hire this compute power to roll back one block. Um, 
So this is actually why there's some people... That doesn't sound like a lot, though, when you put it like that. It's, yeah, that sounds it, quite simple. It sounds of feasible, but the act, of, the act of coordinating that much hash... Coordination, yeah. ...is yeah, yeah, yeah. basically... If you, if you could just rent 50, well, at least 51%, it would be a huge risk, but you can't. You just can't get that much hash power, um, even if you wanted to. You'd have to actually go and set the farms up. Like, nation-states, in theory could be like, you know, secretly building, you know, gigantic mining farms. And this is what they'd need to do. But even then, they still need to run the energy. It's still going to cost them money. Even if you're a nation state, you still need the energy. But it will cost you huge amounts of money just to go back one page. So that you're... To you're, edit a record one page before. So to change your, your transaction from a year ago for that pint, you'd have to change every block one after the other. So you'd have to wind it back, like, the whole year. So there's been a million, been a million there's dollars. been a million transactions up to the point of my transaction. Yeah. Every single one of those million would need to be changed as well as mine. Or, or you just need to go back to the block in order to change it. So okay. what they say is basically by the time you've hit six blocks, it's it's technically impossible to go. It's immutable at that point. So what do they put? What's the probability? Are they put a probability on? Is there a figure on how difficult it would be to do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah you can calculate it down to. It, I mean, that you can. You can literally calculate the pure economic cost of how long it would take to reorg, and it's in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Like, but to go back, and then, any but I mean, and then on the coordination side, I mean, uh, yeah, you, you physicists were seen working probabilities and stuff. Yeah, right? so it is probabilistic. What's the yeah. probability of this happening? Being it being achievable, so I would say like every block you go that requires the you're adding more zeros in probability of like being able to mm. do it technically possible right it's it's possible to unwind every single transaction on the bitcoin network but it's so improbable it's 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 impossible right it's it's um the whole network would need to be captured and new new entrants to the mining pool would need to come in that would would you know they've they've found cheap sources of energy and somehow managed to get these ASICs, which you know are produced by these people, and some somehow they've captured those foundries and had at least two to three years of and those all of ASICs their, are yeah, dedicated machines in impossible. the warehouses you talk about. Yeah. It's like it's it's the most secure network on the planet, and that that's really the value what it's created. <laughs> Has it ever been compromised? There's been issues in the past with it where you you sometimes get what's called a chain split, where you get like two. Two competing, um, two two blocks are found at roughly the same time, and then basically you get like whoever picks the next one. It's called the longest chain rule. Like <coughs> the next miner just picks which chain, and technically things you know the, there's like short reorgs that can happen in there where people could lose funds, but it's not really happened. There was an inflation bug in the very very early years, like where they had to actually edit the code to save the network, but that was like you know back in the 2010, 2011 sort of period where no one is really using it and it's all been patched up since. Bitcoin is the most resilient network that's ever on the, ever happened. It's, 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 um, yeah, it's anti-fragile. You can't, that's, you can't change it. That's pretty astounding, isn't it? Seeing as it was the first one as well. It is astounding. When, when I first, this was the, um, it's up there with e, M, e equals MC squared for me as like one of the most profound discoveries on the planet. Because it's so like it's it's like monumentally important in in my view, um, because it allows us to transmit value anywhere on the network without having to route it through J.P. Morgan um, or access the Swift Swift network or you know one of these gated systems that um, essentially mediate all the value transfer on the planet until Bitcoin. Now we can I can send you some Bitcoin completely peer to peer. Um, and no one can stop us. Literally no one. It's impossible. The hairs on the back of people's necks are going up as they listen to you say that. <laughs> See, it's not all scams. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the hairs go up the back of your neck in the back the wrong way. It's like, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you want, I'm, I'm, I can ah. what people say, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you want to have that overview, oversight? Yeah. yeah. The caveat being is we can do exactly that right now with cash. Yes. It's like it's, you can do exactly the same as you can do with cash. Yeah. I give you 30 quid, no one can stop me. No yeah. one can stop me. I mean, it was billed as, the title of the white paper is a peer-to-peer -peer digital cash system. Like it's the cash is a, um, 
yeah, no one can stock it. I can give you a ten pound note now. No, no one can intermediate that. And that it's just purely the same thing, but digital. And consequently, you can be on the other side of the world instead of in this room, and we can do it. Why is that so advantageous? Um, it's advantageous because, um, for one. Did I say advantageous wrong then? Did I say advantageous <laughs> wrong? Have I been saying advantageous wrong my entire life? Or I'm wrong, I don't know. I say um, words wrong all the time. <laughs> oh God, okay. Why is um, it so advantageous? <laughs> it's advantageous because it disintermediates. Because, um, you know, we it, it sort of dovetails back to what we... We have to trust that these actors in the middle are on our side. And... Ultimately, it's quite easy to end up in a situation where you can't access this system for whatever reason. Um, so there is a billion people in the world who don't have bank accounts. Or, um, banks or collapse. Banks collapse. Yeah, and banks go down. And, and so we, we we're seeing this happen in real time. It's like we have to trust essentially a few dozen guys in suits <laughs> to manage a ledger and do it with um, integrity. Like we, we have to trust them to take our money and not lose it. And they are playing with it. You know, you put your money in a bank, they go and trade with it, essentially. And the couple of the banks that went down recently, you know, they were buying the safest securities that you can get. You know, these held to maturity bonds that are backed by governments. You know, these things, it's not like these, these assets are going to zero anytime soon. It's just that rates went up and they had too much of their float that too much of the people's deposits sat in these things where the money was trapped um but in reality they might be they could be you know there's regulations to stop them yoloing it all into stocks and stuff but pension funds do this you know there's there's pen you know there's huge funds who take your money and go and play the markets with it and ultimately you're trusting those people not to lose your money and in Bitcoin, you're in full self-sovereign control of it. You'd yeah. like your money is in your wallet and no one's accessing it. You know what I'm going to say next, don't you? If Bitcoin is so secure and crypto technology, cryptocurrency, blockchain technology is so secure, yeah. how do events and circumstances like FTX, Sam Bankman fried crop up and yeah. Tornado Cash crop up? How do people lose millions and billions of their hard-earned, hard-purchased cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. if it's so secure? Um, because people play around with um, all this stuff off chain. So Bitcoin was not absolutely not at fault for any of that stuff. You it need was. To, you should describe that. So what you so, mean? So basically, let, let's take. There's two. Uh, I think radically different things there. There's the t tornado cash thing, um, which uses Ethereum, which is like an extension of Bitcoin. We might want to go into how that's different to Bitcoin. But let's just take Bitcoin and FTX for now. So basically. You know, and basically, I mentioned it earlier, but the, the first exchanges that turned up, the first one was called Mt. Gox, and, and it was um, essentially an exchange that was initially used for trading mag Magic the Gathering cards, like online gaming, like little tabletop gaming things. <clears throat> and these things gained value, like collectibles, like, you know, baseball cards do, and, and this guy digitized them and, you know, created a venue for trading them. And, um, you know, when you need um, digital money, you know, like, why not use Bitcoin? And then this ultimately became a venue where you could trade Bitcoin. But essentially what happens there is instead of people just trading it peer to peer, instead of me sending you some Bitcoin and you sending me some Bitcoin back, there's a there's a entity in the middle that stores all the Bitcoin in their wallet and then just creates an off chain like a, a place, like a, a ledger, a secondary ledger, where um, those deposits are no longer in your control, they're in their control. And those boxes, the centralized bits are where it tends to go wrong. So Mount, Mount Gox went down and there was a lot of people who, even worse than me just not buying it, that's bad enough, but, and losing a couple, that's, that's a pain. But there was people who had thousands of Bitcoins on that exchange and yeah they lost them all can you analogize this with, can it, I'm a, if I, i'll try and analogize this with banks if i'm understanding you correctly yeah and that similar. is i put i put five thousand pounds into savings into an ISA in the bank or into yep. a current account in the bank when my five thousand pounds is there 
I don't know what they do with that money. And they use that money to do other things. Yes. That's the yes. fact. They use it yeah. to do other things. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what's going on with my money in the yeah. bank. All I know is that I sh can do and should be able to draw it out or yes. send it to other accounts as I want when it's available. Exactly. Unless something goes wrong with the bank. Yeah, exactly. So basically, all banks fractionalize. You know, they make money by, you know, lending the money that you've put in to other people and get interest on it. <clears throat> um, and they, frank they basically keep a cash flow that you know people come in and out um when they want their money out and there's just like a standard amount you know how much money do people generally take out of the bank on a normal year you know what that's how much of a cash flow you have and a bit of a buffer and everything underneath you can play around with so in terms of activities is that i know it's different technologically but in terms of activities and the way the money is being treated is that similar to Mount Gotts situation, FTX and crypto exchanges. Kind yeah, so of kind of a similar kind of it's yeah, setup. you could absolutely consider FTX as a kind of neo bank. Yeah. Um and it was very much billing itself as that. You know, they raised they raised huge amounts of money, billions of dollars from the biggest VCs in the world. Um because they were they were making the bank play, right? We're, we're basically like yeah, in the future, this is the new bank. You know, this is the first new bank. This is the one where you're not just going to be able to use fiat money. You'll be able to buy stocks. You know, have play on prediction markets, trade crypto. Um, you know, access DeFi, all of this stuff, like all of this new new bits. But as it turned out, um, it was basically a centralized black box that pe people were putting their money in. And they had, they were just doing out, outrageously degenerate things with it. So they weren't buying four year treasure, you know, US treasury bonds. They were buying shit coins with it. They were buying like, so tangentially, and we nearly had a run in with them. So like we, we nearly took money from Almeida because everyone was. So Almeida research was essentially like a fund uh, trading, um, it's like a prop shop trading venue that was essentially separate but not really separate to ftx so sam bankman freed owned both of these entities and one was a classic trading shop and one was an exchange so people put their money into the exchange and then almeida you know take some of the profits that you know and when exchanges are working they print money because they all these people are sometimes trading like you know hundreds of times a day and they're paying little fees every time and they in, in bull runs, they absolutely print money. So it's totally feasible that, you know, Sam's making huge amounts of money and they were just investing in everything. There wasn't one single project at that time that they weren't in. They were in every single round. Um, and what they were doing was investing customers' money into these illiquid assets. So basically the game <clears throat> become, um, you, you know, you invest in these projects that haven't released a cryptocurrency yet. And, you know, quite often, very quickly, these projects will put a token out and then you can flip your money for like a 10x. If you get in this side of the game, then when it when the everyday people come in, token price goes up and they just exit their initial investment. And that worked incredibly well for a huge part of the bull run. But then um, one of the big stable coins crashed, well, like just went to zero. Um, called Luna, it was a UST, and everyone had their money in that thing because it was promising 20% returns. And so all of these big VCs, um, everyone was highly exposed to this stablecoin that crashed. And then the weird thing that happens in crypto, and I've seen this happen a few times over the years, is everyone's buying tokens and then all of a sudden everyone stops. Like everyone, no, you can't sell a single token globally. Like everyone gets the, everyone just understands that we're in down only mode now for a bit. So no one, no one buys any tokens. And that's what happened to them. They put all their money into these illiquid tokens, uses deposits. FTX did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Almeida did, but Almeida FTX did. Yeah. did. It turned out these things were basically the same entity after a while. And... Yeah, they just, they just recklessly used customers' funds, thinking they were going to be able to flip it into the into the market on their own exchange. Um, and yeah, and the, the the exchange was a particularly they they were doing 
all sorts of stuff that was really sketchy. They, they, I really disliked. You know, we, we, we nearly took investment from them. When you say we, who? Uh, a factory now. So, yeah. like, you know, we, we ended up talking to a few VCs highly locate, highly um, adjacent to um, <coughs> Sam Bankman Fried and all that sort of stuff. Like, say, everyone who raised in that period ultimately had exposed to them. Um, and I just really didn't like, I just, yeah, didn't like the practices. They were, you know, this game around launching new tokens on the exchange, they, they were obviously short. They would invest in a project and short, dump their own tokens and then short it at the same time. So they, they were manipulating the market around these, these tokens. And then they were doing incredibly sketchy things around, so you can do this thing where you can like list like 1% of the token and keep 99% of it in reserve. Now you can manipulate the price of this 1% quite easily because it's such a thin flow. And then ultimately you can say, my tokens are worth a billion dollars, even though the, the market cap's only 10 million, right? There's a tiny amount that's traded. And he, he somehow managed to get people to give him huge loans on all of these assets that were incredibly illiquid. So he got in loads of debt, uh, used all that money to like invest in illiquid stuff and um yeah ultimately there was a bank run and it was because um their balance sheet got leaked so it became obvious that actually they're about eight billion dollars in the hole um and they're all stuck in these liquid tokens and actually the loans they've got out are all on their are their own token ftt which is their exchange tokens this other stuff and everyone was like oh my god this is like this is not good so people started taking the money out and then everyone started taking the money out, full on bank run. And this happened to Silicon Valley Bank. The and other there day. wasn't enough there to yeah. pay out everyone. There was no money to pay people out. So I, I was with one of the DeFi founders that morning um, who they had Almeida were like yanking the money out of their protocol. And it was a small amount of money, you know, it, like comparatively, like under a million dollars. When they've got an $8 billion hot, they were scrabbling around for change that morning. I knew it was over. It was, um, and none of that has got anything to do with Bitcoin or crypto or anything. It was, it was all to do with essentially a gigantic scam, um, that was built, that, that was using crypto, um, as the kind of like, you know, sales pitch for a new bank. And it was just like, there's no, not a huge amount of difference between them in Silicon Valley Bank. It's difficult. like a, yeah, it's like a, I mean, it sounds to me like it, it's, it's like a banking, a bank collapses and you're trying to blame Sterling. Yes. Yeah, It's exactly. not Sterling. The bank was not good. Yeah, it's not the asset necessarily. Um, no, the, the, it's absolutely true that there's a lot of the stuff that was trading on there. A lot of these cryptocurrencies that were trading on there were nonsense, you know, that were silly. I want to, sorry, I want to, I just want to pull it up a level. Yeah. Back up a level. So, Cryptocurrency, you mentioned cryptocurrencies, you mentioned tokens a few times. Yeah. Let's explain those two, please. Yeah. So Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. Its goal is to be money. Um, it's not necessarily meant to do much else. Um, its goal is to be a value exchange um, thing. It's a payment token. Um, it's intended to be a kind of store of value or way to trans transfer value to one another. And that's about it. And it tries to do that. Um, you know, so Bitcoin is the classic and most secure one, but there's many others that just do, um, just do value transfer. Um, and that's a cryptocurrency. And then there's tokens, which are essentially, so the, the next, what's worth going here is like a few years after Bitcoin came out in around 2013, 2014, um, a guy called Vitalik Buterin few other people proposed Ethereum, which was an extension of Bitcoin to allow you to do computation on it. So instead of Nick sends you 10 bucks, I can say <laughs> Nick sends a smart contract, a thing in the middle, 10 bucks. And if Hugh puts another 10 bucks in, we can get some other action out. So you can get, you can get put this logic in the middle. Uh, we can do like essentially computer program that sits in between us that decides how this money gets rooted around. So we could say, all right, we both put our money in this in this smart contract. And if this happens, like if it rains tomorrow, like the you can feed in data that says, yep, it's rain, then we've had a bet and 
you know, you win or I win. Or you can put money in a smart contract that has all this complex logic that allows you to um, do things like DeFi, like borrowing and lending and, 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 and all these sort of things. And that was a huge like step up for the space because it allowed programmable money, not just money, but programmable money, um, which is possibly like the real revolution of the whole thing. Because now you're not just the, the kind of things that were traditionally like centralized financial service activity, borrowing and lending and all that sort of stuff. You can basically get an automaton to do it. You can get like a automated bit of software to do it instead of this guy in a suit doing it. Um, so that's that's really revolutionary. And one of the things that Ethereum does is allow you to mint new cryptocurrencies. And it's super simple. It's just a smart contract that says, I want to make NIC tokens. There's a million of them. Um, this is the logic for how you can trade them around, go. And now we've got a new cryptocurrency. And probably around, you know, there's something like, there was a point where there was a thousand new, new tokens a day um, during the bull run. Um, so it really that really exploded the possibilities of what you could do with blockchains at that point. Um, and yeah, it's, it's so tokens are these basically it just it's like a thing, right? It's just a digital thing. What that so if I create NIC tokens, what they are is up to me to say when I publish them. Like if you hold ten of them, you can book into you know for a meeting with me or something. Um, people do that. It's like social tokens and things like that. Well, yeah. So as an example of this, so I have an, I, again, I like my analogy sometimes, right? I have analogized a token before as, uh, yeah, to, like it, imagine, so you can, you could say in the real world, remember dinner, you know, remember meal tickets at school? Yes. Right. So you, a kid gets a meal ticket because they, I don't know, they, they, they're financially not well off and they're getting a meal ticket from the yep. school. That has monetary value, yep. right? That has monetary value probably back in the day of what? A pound or two yep. quid, right, for a meal. It's worth two pounds. It is it is produced for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. I can only do a few things with that, maybe one thing. Yep. Go at lunchtime at a certain time and get one meal for that. And when I do that, it's gone. I can't go to news agents and buy a Mars bar with it. Yeah. They won't take it. I can't go to a shop and try and get a can of Coke with it. It won't take it. I see tokens as the same kind of thing. Yeah. It has, va it has a monetary value, but sometimes that is negligible. Its real purpose is to do something else. So in, so in, so like with the, with the podcast, I started, I stopped it now because of the effort. I started doing an NFT, mm -hmm. producing an NFT of the cover photo of every single podcast. Okay. okay. The purpose for that. So I would, I've given them all away. You can buy, you can go on OpenSea and buy one if you want, mm -hmm. but all the ones that anyone's got, so far i've given them away what that provides you is access if you own an nft you get access into the patrons area yep. of the discord server so you get a you get bravely privileged access to somewhere that is otherwise private just by holding it and that that access is pr i don't have to do anything that's yep. done all in the background and it's you know it's it's uh that so that's the purpose of that NFT, non-fungible, that kind of token. Right? Yes. You know, and there's, and I know we'll probably touch on token use in decentralized autonomous organizations later in this, but that's how I try to ex explain it. Monetary value, restricted or specific use. Yeah, I really like the analogy. I think that that works really well. It's, so one of the major <coughs> things, they call them utility tokens, which is like, you can, it's got some utility in the system. So this token gives you the rights of access to a Discord server. So if I hold 10,000 tokens, I get into this one. If I hold 50,000 tokens, I get into this one. And that's if they're fungible ones, which means they're just all the same. I don't care if I've got this token or that token. It's like like five pound notes are fungible. Like you don't care which one you've got. Don't care what serial number's on it um, because it's five pounds is five pounds, right? That's why they're, they're fungible. But non-fungible ones, like you say, they have a unique nature to them. So they're specific to that episode. Um, but because they're programmable, what that thing is, you know, what the equivalent of that you can buy a meal of it is, can be absolutely anything. And really it's, it's an open, um, an open problem where anyone can use these things for anything. Now, actually people are pretty finding it very challenging to come up with good ideas for using these things. Um, largely because, um, it's, an, it's a new way of thinking. It's like, the why don't you just use dollars instead? 
you know, there's like the the number of tokens that are actually good is less than one percent. Ninety nine percent of tokens are either outright scams or just cash grabs or you know just you know you should be very very skeptical of ninety nine percent of these tokens because it is anyone can set one up. Like I, by the end of this podcast, I could have as a you know a liquid token for whatever reason. Right? It doesn't mean it's valuable just because there's a market there and because anyone can make it is totally disintermediated. And that's how those rug pulls happen as well, isn't yes. it? So I could create a token for next to nothing. I mean, we're talking pounds worth yeah. of my money yeah. and time to set up a token online. Let's say there's 10 million of them. Yeah. And then I could go and I could pay an influencer, for yeah. example, maybe, I don't know, let's say five grand, pay an influencer who's got a big, big pool of people they can pitch to to promote my token on their Instagram page where they got a million followers. I don't know. Yeah. And then of those million followers, the percentage go and buy the token, which puts the token price up. Then I sell all my share at that point, loads of money, leave tokens with nothing. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. But because I got an influencer to say it, loads of people buy this thing, token thinking they're going to make loads of money because crypto, ooh, and yeah. this guy I like to follow said something about it. Oh, hang on, it's all bullshit. What happened? Oh, yeah. well, he was rich because he got on his mates to say something about it. Yeah. I mean, look, <laughs> I hate this game. And that happens all the time. All, all the time. The time. I hate this game more than anyone, right? It's the, <laughs> I find it, you know, it, but you, you got to think of it. It's like what we've just given is a new tool to humanity. The new tool is that we can, anyone can create an NFT. Anyone can create a token. Anyone can create a market for anything now. Um, so I could, you know, tokenize this table if I wanted to and see if I could sell it or whatever. It doesn't mean, um, it just, it, we've just created a new thing that we can do. It's like a new, it's like, think of it like, you know, we invented the knife, right? You know, the knife allows us to cut stuff, allows us to stab people as well. Um, it's the same thing. It's like the, the, what people have got stuck into is because a lot of this, you know, sort of nefarious behavior uses this tool doesn't mean the tool is bad. doesn't mean that we can't do something substantially important with it. It just means that there's a lot of noise that comes with it. And I'm as critical as the crypto industry um, as, as anyone else, right? I hate all that behavior. I hate the crust of influencers that have, you know, that literally just dump on their followers. And um, there, there's a lot of nefarious practices that turned up, but it's like, um, yeah, it's like we've just discovered fire again in the digital world. I consider it like a, a new plane of existence that's just opened up. The sort of digital world um, has been emerging. Uh, we used to call it cyberspace, you know, now I call it the crypto space. It's like some people call it the metaverse, but there's like a parallel plane of existence, which is digital. And this digital world has an economy. Um, and it's fundamentally permissionless. And that means that anyone can use it. Anyone can use these tools. And consequently, you know, bad people use them for value extraction. Doesn't mean the technology itself is bad. Um, it, it means that bad people can use it. Like selling the Rolex, which is fake and getting five. Yeah. I mean like the, and it's just because it's on the black blockchain and everything is visible. Like I, you can literally watch every scam happen in real time globally. Unless, unless it's off chain, like F an FTX example, right? Yeah, I mean, so some the the they're the big scams that you can hide the scam for a oh, long yeah, time yeah, yeah. behind. Like I don't know if you saw FTX's like corporate structure. It's this huge rat's nest of LLCs wrapped in LLCs wrapped in foundations in the Bahamas and all this. You know, it was just like that, and all that was finance. That wasn't crypto. That's actually how most of the like wall street set up right it's all offshore it's all offshore shell companies wrapped in shell companies that's finance that's not crypto um but yeah it's like i always think like if you could see every scam in the world happen right now in real time you'd think humanity's a bad idea yeah. <laughs> do you know what i mean you'd be like yeah. oh the, the the company is a bad idea money is a bad idea and it's be, it's the visibility it's like you can see all the scams happen in real time in crypto because it's all on chain. It's all transparent. Um, if you could see all the scams happening across the world in real time, you'd be just as shocked. It's just, it's, we're not used to this, A, this idea of permissionless action. 
that we can do things without going through these gated um, intermediated places in order to do something. Um, and like NFTs are a great example. It's like the, if you were an artist and wanted to sell your work in the past, you know, you'd have to find a gallery or something like that, right? Or you'd have to build a platform in order to be able, you know, you'd have to go and sell it on the street or something like that. And an NFT allows you to digitize your work and create a market for it instantly and sell it to anyone in the world. And a lot of artists made a load of money without needing gallery endorsement, without needing, you know, they build a, built a following, built a community, built people who liked their work and found some collectors and um, sold their art without anyone standing in between. That's an incredibly valuable thing for humanity, in my view. Um, especially as we move into this increasingly digital world where, you know, digital art's going to be a thing, and but digital objects, digital practice, money's going basically all digital now. Um, so you need these um, you need these systems to be able to to build the foundation for this kind of like new digital economy. Mm. Um, so they're just tools; they're just building blocks. Um, and because there's no brakes on this, um, it d did become like a, a, a place for opportunists to come in. But what's really surprising is how the, the space work learns. So in 2017, ICOs were the big thing. <laughs> And ICOs are basically where you mint your tokens and then you create a sale event and you sell all those tokens to a group of people with a white paper and a website and all this sort of stuff. And yeah, it's that kind of white paper and dreams sale stopped working. They just like didn't work anymore, partly because like, you know, the Americans said, if you do one of these, you go into jail or whatever. Um, but also because the, the space wises up to these things. So it's happened many times where there's like a new thing comes out. Uh, I call it the peak of max scam, <laughs> where it just gets to the point where it gets exploited. It happened with NFTs. NFTs started with like, you know, people, artists selling <coughs> art on OpenSea, creating digital collect collectibles, creating crypto kitties and crypto punks and bored apes and, and, and these kind of like profile picture things. And then it just evolved into this, like everyone in the world trying to sell JPEGs at the same time. And it just turns into this like total mess. And then it just stops working. It's like everyone wises up, hold on a minute, these things have stopped now. And so there's like this organic sort of Darwinian thing, which I think is a genuinely new phenomenon in, in, in for civilization really, that we can all collectively engage in this open economy. And it un un undergoes this kind of like, um, ungated, unfettered growth and evolution. And yeah, if you put money in that, you might lose it. Um, and, but really that's the worst that can happen to you. Um, it's not like, you know, the risk we were talking about earlier in COVID where, you know, there was, you know, one in 20 chance of death, that's risk, right? The, um, there's a chance I might lose my 50 bucks that I put into this token as a different category of risk. Um, but we've got rather obsessed on this risk and protection around this kind of financial risk. Um, when really, for me, we just have to kind of price in the fact that anyone's going to be able to launch a token now. There's nothing you can do to stop it. Like, you can't stop people publishing tokens to the Ethereum blockchain, no matter how many rules and regulations that you put into practice. There's no way you can ever stop that now. We just have to deal with it as a society and get better at building better technology. So a lot of what we're trying to do at Factory Down is build the processes for launching NFTs and tokens and stuff where the people issuing them or the, the people who have the initial idea or the, the whoever's setting the project up or whatever can't rug them. So they can't dump the tokens. In. So in the example you gave earlier, you had 99% of the tokens or whatever that you could dump in the market. But if you don't have access to them and everyone can check that, um, and there's no way to pull the liquidity out of the exchange. And um, the only thing you can do is perform if you want that token to do well. Um, so it's, I think there's solutions, technological solutions to 99% of the rug pulls. So earlier on, a uh, short time ago, you were mentioning about that you haven't seen any really like great use case for tokens. There's yet. some. But it's 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 rare. 
I think there's largely, I was hoping the last cycle, so I've been obsessed on a, a kind of what I consider a new field of study called token economics, which is how you design systems for using these new tools. Like how, how do you, like I can mint a fungible token now and I can create these logic gates in which, you know, these tokens move around and flow value to different actors in the network and things like that. Um, we've just, that, that, that has not matured enough yet for us to give the, that science around token economics is not matured enough yet for good tokens to be systemic across the space. Um, and mostly they're just pure like financial money games, you know, and actually they're quite PVP and people, which is fine for me. You know, if people want to create a little online gambling game where they're sort of playing against each other and trading against each other, fine. You know, there's, as long as everyone's pretty aware of what's going on in that, that's all right with me. Um, but really what we're looking at is how do you make these tokens genuinely valuable? Like what is the thing that you can cash them in for um, that's actually useful? Like native digital business models that exist purely in this kind of like crypto web three space. And it's just so early. And I think largely of what we've seen is a huge explosion in interest um, a little bit too early for for what for the for the technology that's there <clears throat> and there's a lot of these use cases like on the horizon or just emerging but yeah we we the, the whole last bull run happened a few years too early for me um, and consequently all that was there was like dog tokens and you know nonsense um, and the practices around doing it properly weren't there. Um, so it was like it got really popular at a time when all there was was just trash, you know. There's all there was that was just really poor, poor quality stuff. But the, qual the quality will increase over time. So, so where do you, where do you see it going then? Like, why have you got so much skin in the game around it in terms of factory down and everything else mm. you're involved with? If if it's quite uncertain now in terms of what the utility of the technology is going to be, and it's certainly not going to be a money-making thing, yeah. as it appears to be now, but it will be. It's not predominantly. Um, where do you see it going? So I think partly because I, I've spent so much time thinking about this, I can see some of these use cases coming that um, makes these tokens valuable. Like, I think I can just... Like, I'm sold on it. I was sold on it years ago. Um, and... Yeah, why? I guess I see the emerging use cases around DeFi as being incredibly important. So an extension of just money. So DeFi is decentralized finance. So this is, um, I can go and um, lend money or lend my cryptocurrency and earn a yield on it with outside of any sort of financial services, outside of the banks. And that's, that's quite transformative in itself, because if you, you can think of the, you know, this new digital world, it's, it needs the blockchains as a base layer. The protocol is like the fabric of reality there. It's like the digital land for those digital nation states or whatever you want to think, it, think of it. And DeFi is like the financial rails that's like layers on top of that. It's like the it's like the, the, the banks of the di digital world, if you like. I do, I do think there's going to be decentralized banks um in the future that do everything that hsbc does but you can see inside it you know you, you don't need you don't need to trust these hsbc it's to completely transparent completely transparent and i can see um where my money's going now there's new risks which is actually if there's a bug in that code then the whole bank can go down and that <laughs> happens right you know hackers come in and can manipulate the code Again, we're just super early, right? The the primitives, the, the core financial primitives are still in flux. They're still being still being written. So every time one of these hacks happens, it's like the evolution steps forward, right? That we, we learn from the whole space learns what that vulnerability was and patches all their smart contracts up. And then everything gets hardened and more robust and more more anti fragile. So I think DeFi is that layer. And then the next layer on top of that is like organizations. Like what, what is the frame? What's the new LLC? What's the new way to organize, coordinate? What's the new, um, yeah, what's the new limited company um, for this digital realm? Like we've got new, new digital banks, like what's the next layer of civilization building 
So organizations are like the building blocks of society, right? These are the things that we use to coordinate, to do, to do stuff together. So instead of doing everything on our own, um, you know, or through kind of like tribal activity, we realized that, you know, forming an organization and working together on something turned out to be pretty good. So what does that look like in this digital world? Um, and that's where I think that, so you can think of this just like layers of this infrastructure building up over it. And we're still at this infrastructure forming phase. So what I, I've been imagining what this world looks like, you know, once we've got those bits done um, for a long time. And I think that new, that world is like, it's, it's a new, um, it's a new economy. You know, it's, it's a new um, economy that's purely digital that exists on the internet, digitally native, built for the future, will interact with AIs and remote people. You can be private on it. Uh, you can work pseudonymously on it. So in this world, your identity can be an NFT. Um, and you, you can have a, a role in a digital organization where you're a bored ape or something. And no one knows your real name. And no one knows like who you are. Um, but you can still earn money and be trusted with inside that and, and influence an organization. And that, that's the bit that I think is going to be really, really transformative, um, but has been missing up to this point. Um, obviously you mentioned banks like to on, on the finance now. So onto the blockchain technology, how, uh, how's the, uh, how's finance and like the banking sector incorporating blockchain technology into some of its back end at the moment? Cause that, yeah. that is happening. And I don't think yeah. people are aware of it because it, it happens to be coming from the same sector the same quarter that are not talking about crypto very favorably and yeah is when they're using the same technology themselves banks have been interested in this since very very early they were they've there's you know like the bank of england have had a like blockchain department for a long time you know there's like there's because of how secure it is mainly or it's because it's so i mean this is the this is one of the sort of big hypocrisies about the <clears throat> the hostility towards crypto at the moment at the same time, they're saying this is all a scam. This is this this technology is fundamentally useless. But at the same time, ninety percent of the central banks in the world are looking at blockchains as for the new currency. So, which is it, right? You know, is it all a scam, or are you actually going to fundamentally root change the you know the the nature of your financial infrastructure with it? So CBDCs are going to incorporate blockchain technology. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't think. Yeah, that yeah. The case. That's, 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 so, ah. so there's different. Wait, so one of the things, so Bitcoin is incredibly decentralized. I think it's peak decentralization. I think it's the most decentralized system that's ever existed in humanity and might ever exist in humanity. Go on. I was going to say quickly, just describe what you mean by decentralization. There's no pyramid yeah. of power, right? Yeah. So I, I consider decentralization a process. It's like a, um, it's not a decentralized or not. It's a continuum. Um, and it's about the distribution of power. To what degree does one group or one group of people control this thing? And the thing about Bitcoin is like genuinely no one controls it. Um, there's a group of people who write the code, who understand the C++ architecture and, you know, understand this kind of actually kind of weird old dusty code that Bitcoin runs on now. And they have a kind of degree of power in that. But it only gets pushed to the network if all of the nodes and all of the miners agree about it. So there's it's it's incredibly decentralized. There's like no one no one runs it. Now you can wind that back and find quite a bit of efficiency. You can make Bitcoin faster if you go less decentralized. If you if you introduced a little bit more trust in the system, um, and if you keep doing that, you end up at private blockchains, which are like you know, they're run by central banks. And actually what you're doing is trusting the central bank. So um, they will run on something like a proof of authority set up. So there's like proof of work, which is this um, grinding through all these numbers and all that sort of stuff. And there's proof of stake, which is I need to put my money in this box. And if I behave badly, my slate stake gets slashed and I'm risking my money. Um, here I'm burning energy, here I'm risking money. And proof of authority just means I trust this, whoever that person is to not, to run these transactions right. And that's largely what's, um, 
what the CBDCs will look like. And that's the most energy efficient as well, right? Of the three. Well, they're energy efficient because it's basically a database. Yeah. So it's right next door to a database. It's basically a very highly restricted append-only database. But the, the CBDCs will, will not be... You'll, you'll be able to like wind back the transaction. So in a CBDC, they'll absolutely be able to go and edit your transaction for that pint a year ago like that. There's no, there's no reason, there's no way they can't stop it because they are the authority. Um, and that's what's kind of worrying about it because the power to edit the chain, the power to edit what are the real transactions is ultimately whoever runs the thing. And that will be the central banks. Now you can step away from that where you can say, right, okay, let's let's have a collaboration of central banks where, so I actually wrote a, a piece on this years ago, never published it, about the Irish border problem. And I, there's, a, there's a blockchain solution for that. And essentially you can consider the UK and the EU as like adversarial parties where we have to negotiate the policy around who gets to cross the border and for what reason, right? So we can have, now we've got two adversarial actors that have to agree on the policy. And you, it's like a consensus game where, all right, we both agree that this, this is the policy and that, that then becomes the, the rules. And we can only change it if we both agree again. And that's like a step away from like a purely centralized private blockchain to being still a private blockchain architecture, but, but you've now got two actors instead of the, when you move out to the decentralized ones, anyone can join and play that consensus game. Like anyone can join in and run the blockchain. And that's, that's what a really decentralized public blockchain looks like. And these private ones, you know, you can selectively reveal data to people. You can edit the transactions if you agree on it between these parties. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm deeply suspicious of, of private blockchains because they really give all the power to whoever runs, runs the things. And it's just, it, if anything, it amplifies the trust in those actors. It makes those actors more powerful, it has the absolute opposite effect of what Bitcoin does, for example. It gives them more power, not less. And we're not going to have a, a choice in this, are we? If, um, if my money's in the bank now, there'll be a point where when the UK inevitably brings in CBDCs, I won't I, th have a I think it's the kind of thing we should have a referendum on. Uh, I see. Yeah, I do not. Funny I enough, think, I said this last week. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I will. Like, that's the kind of thing I would campaign for. I mean, it, so it's the, again, this kind of programmable money thing. I mean, again, the CBDCs thing is a real rabbit hole, but there's a the Britcoin, if you like, when that comes in. There's Br different ways. Br Britcoin. Britcoin <laughs> is what we're mooting our CBDC as, and they're very interested in it. Um, and it's essentially a private blockchain, and there's different ways you can skin it. You could make it quite a lot like Bitcoin, where you could have, you know, everyday citizens could come in and secure the network in some way and, and participate in validation and um, go really transparent with it. And we and Bitcoin is like Bitcoin. It's a public blockchain that anyone can access. And as you know, it's like cash, it's fundamentally permissionless. Now I know they're not doing that because I've asked them. They're not, they're not interested in a permissionless public, public block, blockchain for the, for the pound. To, which would fundamentally emulate cash. They don't want that because, um, you know, criminals would use it. And if you've got the opportunity to stop cri criminals using it, why wouldn't you? You know, why wouldn't you add in some gating to, I've got to make sure people aren't la laundering money through this thing. So they're going to add a degree of permissioning into it. Yeah. So basically, if I, if I send you a hundred pounds down. It's the first time we've sent money to each other. I'll have to say this is you and this is why I'm sending it. And, you know, you have to like characterize that transaction. And I think you, you might be able to get away with it up to a thousand dollars. The EU is now saying that any, even on Ethereum or Bitcoin, if you send over a thousand dollars on the network, you have to declare it to the government. It's like, that's what they're trying to... They can't control. enforce that though on Ethereum and it's, Bitcoin, can they? No, they can't enforce yeah. it. They and, can't enforce it in the CBDC. Well, what they can do is criminalise people who don't. So um, at that point, it's like mass criminalisation. Like it's the, you, you, you have to, again, it's one of these authoritarian things I see coming in where it's like, we don't want you to have peer-to-peer -peer value exchange. 
Um, so we're going to criminalize it. So I give you in in this in this CBDC future, when yeah, uh, if you if you'd put that in now in terms of cash wise, if I hi Nick, just I want I want to give you a thousand pounds and I give you a thousand pounds in cash, but we've not done that before, and I'm told I've got to declare that I don't declare I'm a criminal for giving you a thousand pounds in cash. Yes, or or however whatever value you know, whatever value it is that it take could be lower. Um, yeah, it and could in the be. future with the disappearance of cash because it'll be digital cash and not physical cash. Yep. That's the issue. Yeah, I mean, the issue is that there will be no way to transmit value to each other without the government seeing all the value. And this has been the case in China for like, you know, 15, 20 years or something, which is why Bitcoin was so popular there because capital controls. So if you, you send money anywhere in China, the government knew about it. So everyone drifted towards Bitcoin in the very early days. Why is that a problem for good people? Um, well, I mean, it depends on, it's not about whether the people are good. It's like, it's what, who, who decides what good is? Like if at the end of the day, you, the people, that's a problem in China because the government can decide any number, like saying anything bad about the government is bad. Right. And then therefore, and then this is basically, it gives that control. So let's say we've got rid of cash and all I've got is a wallet on my phone. Um, and for some reason I've said something on Twitter and I've said something mean about Rishi Sunak, which I do, <laughs> and a lot of other politicians, because, you know, you've got to speak truth to power, right? You've got to like, if, if there's obviously bad politics and obviously, obviously politics that's infringing on human rights and governments do this, um, a lot, then people need to be able to talk, speak truth to power. They need to be able to challenge that. Now, if you say something on Twitter about a politician, they don't like it, and they a touch, touch of a button can shut your wallet down, and there's no cash now, you're eating out bins. There's, there's, you can't buy food, you can't get on the bus, you can't do anything because they've just frozen all your money, and that's it. Uh, and that's a terrifying position to be in, and that's that's really one we could end up in. Well, we've seen Canada doing something similar, to, even without CBDC, yeah. doing something similar over over the last couple of years with restricting people's access to their bank accounts yeah. because of their association to someone they perceive to be bad. The trucker yeah. process is a perfect example. Yeah. So I think there was families who were identified as related to people taking part in the trucker protests. Yeah. They had their bank accounts restricted, right? And they couldn't access money until the protest ended. They weren't even doing anything. Yeah, we just associate with them. There was, like there was people who donated brother, to that. Some, oh, there we go. Yeah, donations. Yeah, that's right. But if they donated oh, to okay, that yeah, 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 cause, yeah. then they froze their bank accounts. I mean, the, the, so we've seen firsthand of the kind of policies that could happen. Now, th those people might have been all right because they've got cash, right? But if the cash is gone and all you've got is the, then that's a, that's a level of control that has never existed before. And I'm, I'm deeply worried about it. People are skeptical, skeptical about cash disappearing. Yeah. Know. So I've, I've asked them, so I said, do you see a future for cash? And there's, oh yes, absolutely. Cash is not going anywhere in the UK. And who's them? I, just, I've, <laughs> I've, so I've spoke to a few MPs, but people, anyone who ends up um, positioning themselves as some kind of like crypto People, I, I end up in these like policy forums, you know, I, there was a point where Matt Hancock was like the crypto guy and I met him a few times and, um, yeah, I just like, you know, there's, it's the surprisingly small pool. It's not like, you know, there's, there's not a huge amount of people in London who are like, you know, um, the, the crypto community is still quite small in London and, and like the, and the policy discourse is very limited, to be honest. It's, it's, it, the, you know, the people actively talking about these things. So, I, you know, I asked politicians on panels and things about these things. I asked, uh, so the last time we, it was explicitly a meeting on CBDCs. I said, do you, do you see a kind of um, peer to peer value exchange being private? You know, do you, do you see um, cash staying around? Oh yeah, absolutely. Cash is staying around. But the reality of it is once you've got the CBDC in, there's no reason why that can't change in the future. Why, like why they might, you know, they might change their minds. The requirement for it is already disappearing. We see it already. There's, yeah, yeah. There's there are many shops, shops and stores. They don't take cash. They yeah, they don't. They don't, don't take, take cash. cash. And so, when that reason for it disappears, and it's it's the use cases become less and less, well, there'll be 
there's money in circulation that they need to maintain, which is pointless. Yeah, yeah, it's and, it's and you know, its effort. there must be a huge chunk of the huge chunk of the economy that's just cash in hand, you know, under the table stuff. And do you think the government might want to get rid of that? Yeah, of course. But what it what the payoff is that we lose our freedom, you know, and it gives them too much power. Now. <clears throat> Any, you've got to remember, every new government that comes in is essentially in control of this thing. Now, the government's flawed as they may be. I don't see them installing some math or mass authoritarian hell. They're just not, you know, we don't have that kind of politics. There's absolutely no reason why some new party could turn up that's like some crazy far-right sort of, you know, extremist party that gets super popular all of a sudden. And then now they're in charge of the the this currency and have the p potential to, to do that. You or know, far left, or far left. Or far left. I mean, it's, it's horseshoe, right? It's mm. just like the extremists in the yeah. middle. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, there's... Um, I say you go, you go far enough left or far enough right, you, you become... Yeah, opposite. it's... You the, start acting the, like the opposite. The, 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 they're, all, they're all just extremists in my view. Um, and largely we're a kind of centrist sort of... Um, country but there's no reason to think that won't change so when you know there's you can install a tool that's incredibly dangerous and might be fine now but it might not be in the future um and then there's that and you know and there's things that will be good for you You know you'll be able to it, it it will probably wipe out a huge chunk of the civil service because you'll be able to like literally airdrop benefits payments and you know uh, universal credit payments things like that and directly into people's wallets You'll be able to take taxes directly out of people's wallets. Don't need HMRC anymore. You know, like, so you, and basically what you're doing is dealing directly with the central banks. So you don't even need HSBC anymore. You don't even need Barclays. You don't need Royal Bank of Scotland. You don't need any of them. Because what you, you can just, you can literally deal $5 payments directly with the central bank. Um, and what that amounts to is a real centralization of power around the, around the money. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very, very skeptical of those things. Um, I think it absolutely, we, our money's already digital, right? It's like we, we largely use Apple Pay and, you know, I barely touch cash anymore. Um, it's just how we do it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we got about 25 minutes left. Cool. Right, uh, now, oh yeah, two things. In fact, you know, it's just, Web3, right? Yeah. I want to count to those for the last 20 minutes, okay? All right. But Web3, this is one of the many, many terms we've been banned, we, well, you, I'm pointing the finger, you've been banned around on this, and yep. people have probably heard them and gone, drop it, we need to get onto that. Right. So Web3 is definitely one, as on people's radars. Web3 related to related to crypto in some way, shape, or form. Yep. What is it? Why is it important? So really, what the, I, I've got my view on what the delineation is but it's not necessarily the accepted one. Um, it just be kind of came a new... It, it, Web3 is a kind of rebrand for crypto, almost. Um, largely mooted by... So, um, Polkadot have a... Uh, their foundation was called the Web3 Foundation. The, the whole idea of Web3.0 actually came from Tim Berners-Lee, who basically invented the internet. Right? It's, he, he considered Web3.0 to be a semantic web. So a kind of evolution of the internet, which is all coded properly. It's all semantically tagged. So if I've got a picture of an orange on my website, the the code underneath will have orange embedded in it. So when I search oranges on the internet, it'll it'll find the orange con content, all the oranges content on the internet. That was it. And then it's kind of drifted away from that idea um, to be a kind of, it's the new internet, right? So you can think of web 1.0 as when it was actually very decentralized internet where most people running their own websites on their own servers and um, web 2.0 was the evolution of this into this more of a platform internet where you've got, you know, your Facebooks and Instagram and, and all these places where you can, and Twitter where you can, you are the publisher, you can edit the website. So websites stop being static and started to become interactive. And, you know, the Web2 sort of game devolved into this fairly exploitative advertising, you know, monetize your eyeballs game. 
and has ultimately resulted in all of the internet sitting on Amazon Web Services or, you know, Google servers or whatever. And ultimately, it's very, very centralized. Centralized and some, there's like five powerful players that run the whole thing. Um, and Web3 promises to be a new version of the internet that's not that. And it has blockchains as the kind of basis for how, you know, this kind of it re decentralizes the web. It, it kind of adds this idea of personal sovereignty back in. And it uses the affordances of crypto. It's got tokens, it's got NFTs, it's, you know, it uses smart contracts. It's it's basically the new internet, but with crypto. Um, I think there's a, there's a delineation for me between crypto and Web3 that's not necessarily agreed upon, but Bitcoin is a permissionless network. Ethereum is permissionless. Um, it's not gated. There's no KYC. There's no identity needed. Um, but I think Web3 will play those games where you, you know, you might get a token that proves you're a, a UK citizen and over 18 or something like that. And that gives you access to these applications. So it's more gated, more permissioned. Um, it's not permissionless. It's like a, it's in order for that new internet to be palatable for the everyday people, it has to like cut down on all the scams and it has to, you know, all the dark markets can't be in on it. And, you know, it, it's got to be a nice, slightly more sanitized environment for the, um, and these apps will have much more of a control over how they're used. That's how I see Web3. It's like a, it's like an evolution of crypto to be more palatable for everyday people by adding a bit more permissioning, playing the game with regulators a little bit more, um, you know, adhering to AML regulations and things like that. So I think Web3 is this kind of um, um, slightly more compliant version of crypto, you might say. Okay. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. Um, right. DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. I know yeah. these get your blood flowing, yeah. juices flowing. They get right? me excited. They say, and, and if I'm being honest, they get me excited. Yeah. Uh, they do. And I know very I know a fraction of what you know about them and i have definitely got no little to no experience in uh, in actually being a part of or maintaining or setting up a dough so let's go from the top i'm trying to try and try and steer it we want to try and steer it from getting really technical on this because i know yeah. i have heard your podcast i listened to your podcast i know how how technical this stuff can get it blows it can my get, mind it, oh, there's, no. there's no escaping oh, no. it it can get weird <laughs> um DAOs, explain to me, what's a DAO? Um, I generally give a different answer every time on this. It's a, it's a kind of, it's a slightly slippery idea, but I kind of, I was alluding to it earlier. It's this, <clears throat> it's this layer of um, the new internet, if you like, which is about organization. So you can consider it like DAOs stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organizations, um, which is a kind of word that Vitalik sort of used very early on. Um, the Vitalik, Ethereum, Ethereum founder. Yeah, the Ethereum founder, Vitalik Buterin, used this. It's in the Ethereum white paper. And, you know, he imagined these things as like digital organizations that live on the blockchain that um, use smart contracts and, and people exist at the edges of them. So they're like a, a, new, a new organization, purely digital, that run on a kind of consensus. So it introduces humans back into the game a little bit. So Bitcoin is a pure aut automated system. I consider Bitcoin a DAO. Um, its job is to secure the network and its job is it, it, it pays people money for securing the network. Um, and that's what it does. It's a, it has very rigid policy architecture. It can be upgraded. Um, and that's what basically you can imagine a DAO is, is like it uses um, blockchain technology to create this set of rules that we all agree on and um, that those rules might govern a token they might govern um, NFT supplies they might govern um, a DeFi contract they might govern a gaming contract like a new blockchain game or whatever um, but you can consider them the place that allows governance to happen on these automated bits of software. So um, let's say we've got like a, let's say we've created a game where 
it's um it's like i don't know something like a a, a card game that we're all playing on these things um, and it works fine for a bit, but we realize actually there's a way that like people who got in early are overpowered in the game and they just keep winning and it's not fun anymore. Um, we can say everyone who holds these tokens, we can change the game. Like if we all agree, let's change the game to change the rules of the smart contracts and it all changes again. And that's really what DAOs are about. It's adding a degree of social consensus back into something. So Bitcoin can't really upgrade very easily. The only way it changes, and this is why I consider it a DAO, it's, it's got 90% quorum. Like if, if all, in order to change any of the code on Bitcoin, 90% of the miners need to agree. And it take, consequently takes like five years. They're very, very conservative. Um, upgrades happen very sparingly. Um, they're very small upgrades. Um, but essentially DAOs reintroduce things like voting back in where we can actually be much more agile about changing the the rules just to just to bring us into the digital realm for people people thinking on the like the, the mechanisms for voting the mechanisms for con you know, agreements and consensus yeah like that in the bitcoin upgrade example now i think this is the case but the so the code would be produced be presented for upgrade it would be presented digitally that code would be made ac accessible yeah visible to all nodes all people who are eligible to say yes or no towards that yeah they would and then they would view it and respond either, I mean, in the most basic sense, binary, either yes or no. And they yep. respond digitally. They yep. have to put their digital signature, as an example, and say, yes, I, I, um, I'm I, happy for this to be upgraded. That is then recorded on chain. Yep. So their vote is on chain, yes. If you get 90% or more of those people who respond, yes, you, it's on chain. And, it, and there's an automation which recognizes that, yep. yes, and then executes the upgrade of the code according to whatever was in the smart contract, which is a digital code which checks all the boxes and consensus and goes, yes, we've met all this, this criteria, do what we said we do. Yes, exactly that. So you consider it like a, like a digital democracy. Which so, is difficult to uh, defraud. Yeah, it's like, it's a, let's imagine we did a referendum um, and let's, so let's, let's say we did the Brexit referendum. If it was a DAO, um, when the vote was done, Brexit would have happened, right? It's like done. It's just executed at that point. We'd already got all the policy changes done in advance and there's no backsies. It's like it, it goes, it goes, it's done. The whole state changes um, based on the outcome of the participants in that game, right? The holders of the token. Um, current, the, the, the sort of, it might be worth going through like the current design of like mostly what these things are is like, okay, there's a token in circulation and you can consider each token like a vote in the system. So let's say there's a million tokens. If you own 10% um, of the supply, you've got 100,000 tokens, you've got 100,000 votes and you've got 10% of the voice in that network, if you like. Um, and then we say, okay, let's say this is a new kind of lending platform. It's a DeFi thing. Um, we want to be more competitive in the market, so we want to change our uh, interest rates um, and incentivize people more with our native token. So someone will set up a proposal, and it's normally if like, let's say you've got um, a million tokens, or um, like in previous example, let's say I've got 100,000 tokens. <clears throat> that gives me rights to make a proposal but we need over half a million of the um, tokens. We need over 50% of the supply to agree to this change. And if everyone says yes, it changes the smart contracts and we're in a new world and a new organizations that's changed after that. Um, and really this is quite a powerful thing and that's the most basic ones that exist at the moment. So there's, um, there's mostly the DeFi ones that are in interested in the most. So like MakerDAO, is essentially like a decentralized central bank and it issues a currency called DAI and um, it's a stable coin. It's pegged to the US dollar and essentially the DAO governs this, um, makes sure that this thing stays at around a peg. So it adjusts the monetary policy and it, it essentially the token holders, the maker token holders are the governors of that central bank. 
Um, so that's a really nice example. And then there's there's others like Compound, which is another DeFi project. And there's you know lo lots of these things where they're shifting around the monetary policy. Um, but increasingly, we're seeing like cultural ones turn up where NFTs like so you, you essentially you could turn all the board ape holders into a DAO. They do have a DAO, but they use a token. But you could say like all the NFT holders can vote on, you know, what party we go to on Friday night. And it, it moves away from this kind of monetary policy game stuff into really anything we, we want to decide what to do together. Um, and typically, uh, these, you know, dis disparate group of people will have a shared pot of money to spend. So um, the NFT DAO, which I think is probably where the next, you know, big phase of DAOs will go, might be, um, let's say we sell 1,000 NFTs and all the money goes into a pot. Like uh, we all played, let's say one ETH each and a thousand ETH goes into a pot. And now we all decide how to spend it. We've got our tokens, uh, which might be pretty pieces of art and or profile pictures or whatever. And they represent our membership in that DAO, but also give us the rights to control what's in that treasury. So you can imagine someone minting a gardening DAO tokens where we've you know got different flowers on, on our nfts but each one of those nfts gives us a voting rights on how to spend our pooled money and you know we might put on a gardening show or you know we might make some educational material or you know whatever we want you can do that now though um yeah you can do that now um i mean how would you imagine yeah you can set up a club um the chat what it does is just greases the wheels on the whole consensus piece like with because we've got crypto we can pool this money and you can do it in a trusted way you can do all this stuff in a trusted way with like an app or whatever but ultimately you'll be trusting some guy in the middle not to run off with all the treasury money and there's not really any good tools that allow you to vote on what to do with that money um, so really a lot of what we're building is like, how do you turn these tokens into voting identities? So building good decision-making tools. So it's not, we, we're going further than just like, shall we vote yes and no on something? Yeah. So in the case of, like I was part of a, a charity committee, small charity mm -hmm. um, uh, for a few years. And in that case, the way it was set up in, so According to the Charities Commission, you have to have a minimum number of uh, trustees. I think it was three. And you had to have some minimum positions in that charity. Mm -hmm. And it was like four, maybe three at least. So there's a chairman, secretary, treasurer. Mm -hmm. Chairman, secretary, treasurer. And we had a president as well. Um, the charity had a bunch of members, pay, paid membership. It was a military charity, a military association, but it was a mm -hmm. charity. Paid membership into a bank. And that and, to, and that account was the charity's account to do what they wanted to do with it. Only three people yeah. had access to that account. Yeah. So, and I was one of them and two others on the committee were. Now, if three of us were ourselves, and I've seen this in mm -hmm. other organizations. Oh, everyone's seen this in other organizations where you get bad people yep. in control of other people's funds, which essentially what that was. If we were the wrong people, we could have been t using that money for only various purposes. No yeah. one else ever know it. Yeah. Take it and run off. Yeah. Now, in your example, so where a DAO is concerned, it goes back to the transparency on chain stuff. Transparency, cons forced consensus. There's no way in in that example. If we were a DAO, so yeah. like, see, this is why DAOs excite me. I, I see a real. I think we just spoke about this before when we first met. A real great use cases in charity. Yeah. Um, absolutely. In in so in that case, there would be no way. It's all digital. There would be no way myself or the other two committee members will be able to draw anything out of that bank and use it unless the the branch or a quorum of the branch or yeah. whoever we had as a branch decided who should use that money and who should have the authority had been decided before. We couldn't do it. It would be impossible. Yes. We wouldn't have the access. You, you literally can't do it. That's the idea. It's like, I don't need to trust those three people to not embezzle these funds. For one, I can see inside the treasury at all times. So I can just look at the look at the treasury and there's you will have a nice dashboard where you can see exactly what's in it down to the dollar and the only way you can get money out of it is by say like we need you know ten thousand dollars in order to do this thing and then you can say yeah okay we trust this actor to go and do that um or you can 
we're exploring these things called sub DAOs, where you can like give this other smaller group. So you can say this 20 of the 200 people are going to be in charge of that 10,000 to go and do something. Um, and it's really all about trust. It's just about, uh, there's a great book called Blockchains, A New Architecture of Trust. And that's one way to look at it is that instead of having to trust these centralized actors, and, th and this is where all the legal bits come in, you know, if like you go and embezzle those funds and you get caught, there's like, you know, you get prosecuted by the police and all that sort of stuff. And you, f you fall back to the judicial system to, to look out for this stuff. Um, but really blockchains allow you to build that trust, not through like post hoc enforcement, but through like direct action of like the rules of the game are set and no one can deviate from these rules unless we all agree we're going to change them. And consequently, we can build this new kind of trust game between people where I can trust like complete randos on the internet with some money um, because I want to see what, you know, software they build or something like that, right? And um, it, it, it really fixes a lot of these problems with all the scams in the space. Because mo most of the issues that we've seen is people buy these tokens, money goes into a pot. And actually, if those people aren't trustworthy, they do exactly what we were talking about. It's actually three people who go and embezzle it. And it happens a lot in crypto. We didn't embezzle it, by the way. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I, voluntary, I voluntarily left the organization. I wasn't, I wasn't Yeah, down. no, no, you're a trustworthy <laughs> guy. Yeah, I know that. Um, but yeah, no, it's like, but you ultimately you wouldn't need to trust any of these centralized actors because it's just, it's, the game that we've all agreed to by buying this token was agreed at the beginning. And if we want to change those rules, we have to agree on it. And what that creates is the context for a new kind of collaboration. So I, I consider DAOs a kind of collaboration technology where, or like a special interest group on the blockchain, right? Where like, okay, I'm really into gardening. I want us to, to organize a gardening show in London or whatever, uh, but I've got no money. Like, and so let's go and find a bunch of people who are going to buy into this DAO because they want to see this show happen and they can watch me build this and build a community and coordinate together and involve all of these people in doing it. And you can just imagine new kinds of collaboration on the internet. So it's that coordination bit that I think is going to be really transformative. I think there's going to be um, a, a revolution in social coordination where typically in order to for that coordination to happen, you have to form a limited company, you have to form an LLC, um, you have to go and hire people, and it tends to be quite geolocated to a particular area. Whereas a DAO could be, yeah, let's do this. And then people from everywhere all over the world, like a truly, like, truly global audience can decide to jump into that thing and, and work on it together. So truly global coordination, truly international, truly permissionless so anyone can jump in and out of this thing by buying the tokens so the membership is fluid um, so they behave very differently to conventional organizations which are, tend to be quite gated tend to be quite local um, and these things can be just like massive open online collaborations isn't there a isn't there a big blocker there or like a, a, a reduced accessibility for people who don't have a technical understanding, a technical level of knowledge to just go ahead and create this digital organization. Yeah, for now. And I'm, I mean, this is a lot of what we're working on. And I, I want to create the tools that, you know, <clears throat> a granny can set up a community down for the local fate or whatever, you know, let's all pull some oh, money. It's a temporary thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Well, it's like we are exceptionally early into these tech, in, in, into these technologies and and it's yeah it's very much a kind of the people who are actually using these things are like hobbyists and technologists and innovators you know it's that we're, we're at that innovators bit of the, the the rogers diffusion of innovation curve um we got like innovators then early adopters then early majority late majority and laggards um to get over to the sort of late majority it all just needs to be totally seamless um, it needs to be like, yeah, I'm setting this thing up. I can do it on my mobile phone. I can send everyone a WhatsApp message and say, yeah, if you want to throw in 20 bucks this week into this thing, we'll decide how to spend it. Um, and that's where I think it'll end up. It, it'll just be, at the moment, all these things are very self-referential. Self They're all about crypto. 
you know, all the DAOs are like the DeFi DAOs, weird monetary policy experiments. But ultimately, it will be people, you know, communities pooling money together to, to, you know, improve their local park or improve the shared ground in a community and things like that. Um, so community DAOs are going to be like, I've, I've got Stoke DAO. Um, Dot com, which I'm saving for. Like. <laughs> yeah. uh, and you're from Stoke. I am from Stoke on Trent. Yeah, I'm a Stokey. Uh, and my dream there is like, if I ever make it one day, I just want to put a million dollars in a pot and let the people of Stoke decide how to spend it. No, like no restrictions. You decide. And that DAO will allow people to like, yeah, I, th I think we should do this. I think we should do this. I think we should do this. And then the tools we make sorts all that by like what we actually want. And then when we agree, we send the money to actors who go and action it. Um, and you, yeah, you can just sort of imagine that it's a blank slate at that point. The um, Our tagline is, if you can dream it, you can doubt it. And that's like, I do think these things are going to be like a canvas for human coordination. And it, they can be anything. It's just all you need is the basic tools to be able to pool money, decide how to spend it, and make it so that some people can't run off with it. And I think we'll just see an explosion of of uh, of new things appear in the world. So what what's factory do? What does factory do now? What's it focusing on? To is it make is it about accessibility or what? what it's it's about building the infrastructure for these things. So um, normally when you so the downs come through like a life cycle. Um, they start with like the token issuance. So like who gets the tokens at the beginning? And normally where these things are like most popular is right there, but everyone likes shiny new things, right? So everyone's like really excited about getting this new new token, new thing. So a lot of what we've built is like um, the technical infrastructure for mediating that issuance without it all going wrong, without it turning into a big pump and dump. If you look at all the in, uh, issuances of new tokens, they tend to have this huge spike and then they just go like this over months and and a lot of what we've done is to, to build that, to make it like fair launches, we call them, to like get these tokens in the hands of people who want them without this like asymmetry where everyone gets dumped on by insider VCs or whatever. Um, so yeah, we're building the infrastructure for this stuff. We've got five or six different products that meet different parts of the, if you, if you want to launch an NFT, we're going to, won't be long before we can, if anyone in the world wants to launch an NFT, they'll be able to come and launch it completely for free using our tech. Like you won't need you, and you'll need very little technical knowledge. Upload your JPEGs, say how many tokens you want, hit go, tell your friends, and you'll be able to use our tech to do that. Same with the fungible token. Um, but then we've also got all the voting tech and everything on top of that. Um, so yeah, it would you can consider it a bit like uh, the Google Office Suite for decentralized organizations or Office 365. Instead of Google Sheets, we have tokens. You know. Um, you know, and, and there's there's just lots of different tools that are required for existing in this new world. We don't even know what they are yet. You know, in like five years of DAO practice, we'll we'll have discovered that there's a load of new tools that we need. Um, so yeah, we're just trying to create this kind of uh, framework, a kind of factory that creates these things. So we're going to be a decentralized organization that builds DAOs and launches DAOs. So yeah, we're just trying to be the place that if you want to launch one of these things, we're the people you come to. Um, you would come to us because we do it as we've got the nicest, easiest way to do it with the best user experience. It's going to be basically free as much as we can do it. Um, we, we, our business model is we basically, if you launch a token and sell it, we'll take some of the proceeds when you launch it. But all of those proceeds go into the treasury. You know, and then whoever's a member of Factory DAO can decide how to spend it. And a big part of our goal is to essentially hire DAO leaders, we call them, um, who will be all over the world helping people to launch DAOs. So um, you can think of it like a, um, a set of tool, like a toolkit that we publish onto a blockchain. And that toolkit's there forever at that point. You can't take it down. So at that point, these tools are usable by absolutely anyone. Um, and really the DAO's job is just to help people use them. Yeah, I do. It's, it's, it's probably the one aspect of 
what te- what crypto technology sort of enabled and unveiled is probably the most exciting to me. I, I think the same here, man. I think I think it's the for me. It's like the I, I consider them like the end game for crypto because it wraps it all together. So we'll make these all these new tools. We'll, we'll invent things like NFTs. We'll invent things like DeFi and tokens and Web three games and all this sort of stuff. But DAOs are like the wrapper that that allow any any of these random people to like govern them, run them, coordinate them, make sure they run properly. Um, they're the kind of wrapper that stitches it all together and um, sends it in a good direction. Just to finish off, what is the most interesting uh, use? case or what interesting example of a DAO you've seen? Uh, I'll give you the example. So we're building one at the moment for um, the Palm Network. So people might know the Palm Network from (coughs) Damien Hurst did an NFT um, about 18 months ago now. And it's this kind of, so Damien Hurst, very, very popular contemporary artist, and he made an NFT called The Currency. And it was like he handmade all these, um, you know, little spotty kind of contemporary bits of art. And you got an NFT, you bought the NFT, and in a year's time, you could cash it in and get the physical one. If you want, you could burn it. And the bits that, the, the ones that didn't get cashed in, he, you burnt the physicals. When you say burn, so you ch- that, that digital NFT that you bought, that would get destroyed, not used Yeah, so again. you can send them to what's called a burn address, where they're basically never accessible again. So it reduces the supply of the NFTs. <clears throat> and then he, the ones that didn't get claimed, he burnt the corresponding physical art. Uh, anyway, so that was the kind of big um, thing that happened on the Palm Network. It's new blockchain. And we're building, um, you can go to palmdow.app to check out the, so we're building a kind of custom DAO for the Palm Network and we're working with the Palm Foundation there. And this is going to be a place where um, creators, it's going to be like the NFT chain essentially. So um, we think it's going to be where all the NFT activity will have. It's like an NFT specific blockchain. And the blockchain itself, the protocol will have a DAO. And its job is to seed creativity. So it'll have a treasury. So it'll issue grants to for artists. So we've got, um, actually it's closing today. If you, the, the we've got Nadia from Pussy Riot, um, who's kind of activist sort of um, artist um, who's running a competition on this DAO. Got about 50 different applications of art pieces on there. She's going to curate which of the top five are finalists and then whoever's holding the tokens will be able to vote on who the winner is. And then the winner gets, you know, showcased in NFT NYC and on Broadway and all that sort of stuff. And that's the kind of thing that where I think it's going to get really exciting is this like creative and culture formation pieces. So you've got like a DAO that will curate and 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 create new art and new culture and things like that. So yeah, we're dead excited about that. It's been, um, we, we, we're kind of shipping the DAO and the run up to the launch of the token itself. So we're going to be launching the Palm token and we are doing all their voting and governance infrastructure and we the, we've got these non-transferable NFTs, they're called proof of contributions that you can get for like creating stuff. And so you build up these tokens in your wallet that represent your kind of identity in the DAO. So by the time this is released, that will have happened. So yeah, yeah. So what's the timelines on it? So the vote on Palm DAO will start next week. So on Monday, I think there's a week of voting on, on that, but there's going to be stuff like we're going to, mm keep rolling these comments. So you can imagine this thing as like a, a rolling cultural creative hub that just keeps running. I mean, the, the goal is, is to create this thing that essentially self perpetuates where creative communities come and request funds and get granted to them by the token holders. They go and create new art, they launch not new NFTs and that's good for the network. And it creates this kind of virtuous cycle. And I think, um, so yeah, NFTs and creative DAOs, I think, um, are the bits that are exciting me. I think it's where it's going to be the real breakout moment for them, where people see, oh, I can go and, uh, I'm an artist, I can go and get some money to to um, go and produce some art and then sell it on the network. And um, yeah, I think that's going to be exciting. Cool. I know you got to get out here and look at the time. 
Nick, really enjoyed it. We should definitely do this again if you're up for it. Yeah, and, of course. Um, thanks. It's been education. Like, uh, like, like, like uh, your podcast. In fact, your podcast. Um, just give let, give people a heads up at the podcast and also where to get hold of Factory Dow and see what's going on. Uh, yeah, so um, our, pa- uh, our podcast is called Crypto Market Watch, um, and we it's it's out of our projects. We we started life as a prediction market called Finance Vote, and you can find that Twitter on at Finance Vote, and that's where you publish that um, podcast. Um, you can find me on Twitter as at Doctor Nick A, and you can find Factory Down with at Fact Down. Excellent, and the podcast is also on Spotify and everything. Yeah, it's on Spotify. Yeah, 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 yeah. perfect. Dude, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. It's been great. Yeah. Thanks a lot.